Hi everyone! In this video we are going to be talking about our next grammar concept with which is the concept of verb moods. Now you might be sitting here thinking verbs can have different moods. These are two very different concepts, Ms. Kreider. However, once we go over it, you, it will definitely make sense. So to start, you might be thinking, what the heck even are verb moods? So verb moods are basically how a verb expresses uh, the way the author or speaker feels about something. Verb moods are used to show perspective in our writing or in our speaking. And there are five types. So we have the indicative mood, the imperative mood, the interrogative mood, the conditional mood, and the subjunctive mood. Now, the first three should look familiar because we used, uh, they are the same as the types of sentences that we discussed in the parts of a sentence unit, but the conditional and subjunctive will also be easy once we go over them. So why don't we just dive right in with the indicative mood. So the indicative mood is when verbs are used to express a statement, a fact, or an opinion. This is considered the normal verb form just because most of the times as humans, we speak in the indicative mood. We are giving statements, we are providing facts, or we are providing our opinions. That's just the way that our brains work. We use the indicative mood in our writing to make our writing clear and to the point. So when you are speaking in the indicative mood, the goal is to make everything clear and to just present the facts the way they are. So let's look at three examples of the indicative mood. So the first is that Ms. Kreider teaches ELA. This is a statement. It is a fact. You can prove it. It is clear. It's to the point. It tells you what I do. The next is Mountain Dew is the best drink. Not only is this a statement, but this is a, an opinion, definitely a very wrong opinion, but an opinion that nonetheless, it's also very clear. We know exactly what this person thinks the best drink is. And then finally, you have, I am an eighth grader at LMS. So once again, it is a statement and it is currently a fact. So the next mood is the imperative mood. And you might remember this one, as I said, from parts of a sentence, because an imperative sentence, like the imperative mood, gives a command, a demand, an instruction, or a request. We call this particular mood the bossy mood just because it's giving us commands and instructions. It's being the boss of us and it is telling us what to do. As I said, from that parts of a sentence unit, you might remember that sentences in the imperative often do not have a subject of the sentence. And that's because, for example, if I'm giving you a command of do your homework, um, if I would add in the subject, it would be you do your homework. And sometimes that doesn't sound as clear or comes out sounding like a, a statement of fact rather than a command. So the, the purpose of using the imperative mood in our writing is to give orders politely or forcefully or to call a reader into action like at the end of a research paper. So at the end of a research paper, we need to tell our audience what to do with what they just learned and you would use the imperative mood there to do so. So we've got two examples of the imperative mood. One is definitely more polite and one is definitely more forceful. So my polite example reads, please help your sister with her homework. It's more of a request or an instruction. We're using the word please so we know it is polite versus our forceful example of clean your room. That is definitely a command or demand depending on how messy your room is. And it is definitely being forceful with the use of the exclamation point. So once again, the imperative mood is our bossy mood and it helps to give commands, demands, instructions, or requests. Our next mood is the interrogative mood and it is used to ask questions, either direct or rhetorical, like interrogative sentences. You will know that a sentence is in the interrogative mood because it uses a question mark at the end. So the purpose of any sentence in the interrogative mood or really any question that you are asking is to make the reader think and question their understanding. Whenever teachers are asking you questions, that is ultimately our purpose. We want you to think and question your understanding of what you are learning in our class. So I have three examples of the interrogative mood, even though you are already experts at this one without even knowing it. But my examples are, what is the claim of I have a dream? How would you act if you sell bullying? And why is the sky blue? 
All of these are great examples of the interrogative mood. They are all asking questions. They are all, in this case, direct questions. We don't really have any rhetorical ones except for maybe that middle one. And all of these questions are really used to make uh, the reader or the listener think about what is going on in their world. So once again, the interrogative mood is like an interrogation where you are being asked questions. Our next mood is a mood that does not go with a sentence type, but is it is a type of mood called the conditional mood. So the conditional mood is the if you give a mouse a cookie mood. And what I mean by that is that the conditional mood is used to indicate that if something is done, aka a condition is met, another thing will happen. If you think back to that children's book, if you give a mouse a cookie, basically that whole book is saying, if you do this, then this will happen. Normally that is what the conditional mood looks like. It says, if something happens, then something else will happen. It is like the cause and effect that we see in ELA class in, and in science class. The conditional mood is used when the writer wants to show that an action is required for an outcome to occur. So let's look at some examples of the conditional mood. So I have underlined where we have this little condition part in the sentence. So my first example is once again set up like if you give a mouse a cookie. So my first example reads, if you want a Jolly Rancher, you have to share your writing. So the first part of this sentence, if you want a Jolly Rancher, is telling you that if you want this thing, it indicates that if something is done, or if something would happen, AKA you want the Jolly Rancher, you have to do something, AKA you have to share your writing. The condition has to be met. Our second example is a worded differently than what you might typically see. And it reads, I would go sky skydiving for a million dollars. So basically it is telling me that this thing will happen. So I would go skydiving if, a condition is met, AKA I am getting a million dollars. So once again, the conditional mood is the, if you give a mouse a cookie mood, and it is used to indicate that if something is done, another thing will happen. So our final mood is the subjunctive mood. So the, ex the subjunctive mood is used to express an unreal situation, a wish, or the way you want something to be. So a key word that you will see in the subjunctive mood is were. You may have read books when you were little or done the project of if I were the president or if I were the principal. Uh, when you do projects like if I were the mayor, if I were the ruler of the world, that were there is expressing an unreal situation. You could probably never be the ruler of the world because we are a very diverse world and we don't have a single ruler. So we're expressing an unreal situation. If you see a were in the um, intro dependent clause, for example, if I were the mayor, then you are dealing with a subjunctive mood because you're expressing the way you want something to be in an unreal situation. So the main purpose of the subjunctive mood is to express the writer or speaker's desires or hopes mostly for the world. When you're doing those, if I were the mayor or if I were the ruler of the world, you're trying to express your hope and desire for what would make the world the best place that you think it would be. So let's look at some examples. So my first one is an I wish, so we're dealing with a, a wish. So I say, I wish we lived in a world where I got my coffee for free. This is a huge wish and guess what? It's also expressing the way I want something to be. I want the world to be a place where I can go and get my coffee for free. Sadly, it's not, which is why it's also an unreal situation. My next one is, if I were tall, comma, I could get my own sticky notes from the ceiling. In this example, you see that subjunctive were there. It's saying, if I were tall, I'm expressing um, the way I would want something to be. It's this unreal situation. I am at the age where I am not going to grow. So I have just come to the conclusion I will not be tall. But if I were, I could do this potential thing. And then finally, I hope that you all understand the subjunctive mood. Hopes go with the subjunctive mood as well because it is expressing the way I want something to be. When you hope for something, you are wishing something upon someone or upon yourself. So at the end of the day, the subjunctive mood um, 
could also use the word hope. So the subjunctive mood is one that you will, will definitely most likely see on the PSSA. So before we end this presentation, I want to show you a PSSA style example of the subjunctive mood. But to summarize, the subjunctive mood is used to express an unreal situation, a wish or a want, um, especially when it's the way you want something to be. And make sure you're looking for that keyword were. So this is an example of a way that a PSSA style question for the subjunctive mood might get set up. So this reads, read the sentence. If I blank the principal, I would give all students an A in ELA. Which word or words correctly complete the sentence? So we have three options of could be, am, were, or would be. Um, I already know I could eliminate be if I am the principal. It's just not worded correctly. We don't have the correct tense, especially since would is in the back. Um, we know that that can't be correct. If I could be the principal, kind of works, but it's also not as strong and straightforward. If I could be the principal is kind of suggesting maybe I want to be, but I'm not going to be. It's not very strong. So then we're left with C or D. If I would be the principal kind of works, but it doesn't really express the subjunctive. Um, we're talking about this unreal situation. So if it would be, the answer would be C. If I were the principal, so if I have this, if I have this thing happen to me, um, this unreal situation, I would give all students an A in ELA. Wouldn't that be a fantastic way to end your year? Um, but at the end of the day, the subjunct, when you see a question like this and you see that there's a blank in that intro dependent clause, most likely your correct answer is going to be were. So with that being said, that is all of the information that you need on verb moods. Have a great rest of your day and we will keep on practicing verb moods the next time I see you. Bye!